Hello, Hi. I'm Ty Edwards. Uh, I'm director of the Kansas Studies Institute, and I want to thank you all for coming today to listen to our wonderful speaker, Julian Baer. I forgot my notes, of course. All right, so let me introduce Julian. Uh, Julian's first book, One Degree West, Reflections of a Plains Daughter, won the Midlist Press's first series award and a, a Willow Award for women writing the West. Her essays have appeared in venues ranging from the New York Times to High Country News. She was a National Endowment for the Arts Fellow. She has taught at the University of Wyoming, University of Iowa, the Iowa Summer Writing Festival, and Denver's Lighthouse Writers. Prior to teaching and writing, her career interests ranged from management of a San Francisco recording studio to filmmaker to farmer. I like that diversity of resumes. Uh, she has an ongoing commentary series called Our Turn at This Earth that airs weekly over High Plains Public Radio. And then, of course, what she's going to talk to us about today is her book, Ogallala Road, A Story of Love, Family, and the Fight to Keep the Great Plains from Running Dry, which, as you may know, is on sale down in the lobby. And she's going to be signing copies after the talk today. Uh, that book is a Kansas notable book, a book list editor's choice, and a finalist for the Mountains and Plains Booksellers and High Plains Book Awards. And... I will say, because I've read it, it's just a joy to read. Uh, she's born and raised in Kansas, and she's going to talk about some of those experiences today. And we will have time at the end for questions. So I will bring a mic around so we can ask questions and hear them. So let's welcome Julene Baer. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to be here giving the Kansas talk, especially since I'm from Western Kansas. And we never really thought of ourselves as figuring very highly in the map of the Kansas universe. <laughs> My brother used to call us the armpit of the universe. So, but now I think, wow, that's figuring pretty highly in the universe to have a whole body part. <laughs> <side here. laughs> so, in fact, over time, I came to realize that Western Kansas, even though I had left it by then, I gradually began to realize that it was the center of my universe. It probably always will. It's a very strong cornerstone of my identity. Um, I think that's largely because of the way that the sun shined there and it stretched forever, the vastness of it. Um, I'm a Westerner at heart. And I believe I am a Westerner at heart because I grew up in the West. When growing up there, I never thought of us as in the Midwest. I thought we were in the Great Plains. Now you don't even find that map on geography textbooks and so on. You just see the Midwest and then the West. So somehow Kansas has been, Western Kansas has been conflated into the Midwest, which doesn't seem right to me because they are two very different geographic regions. When you go West, in this state, about the time you hit Salina, the sky is higher, the sky is bluer and clearer, the distances are greater, the air is loftier, and you know you've entered a different climate, essentially. Um, Wallace Stegner says that, he said about himself, I, do, I may not know who I am, but I know where I'm from. And I would argue that in the case of many Westerners, those are the same thing. We are closely identified with landscape. If you grow up in the West, you tend to be part, at least part of your identity flows from the land itself. Well, I didn't always feel this way. <laughs> uh, I went to college for one whole summer session and one fall semester at Kansas University. And then I married this guy and we took off for San Francisco together. Um, I was 18 years old, and I thought, Kansas is boring. I don't want to ever come back here. I'm done with it. Forget it. It was going to be so much more exciting in San Francisco, I thought. Well, about eight years later, I divorced the husband, and I started changing and maturing, and I went home for a wheat harvest, and I was so taken with the landscape at how beautiful the uh, golden wheat stubble and the, and the fresh, the new wheat and then the wheat stubble together. Um, how beautiful it was and the sky was this satiny blue and the wheat trucks were this bright red and it was exciting to be home for wheat harvest and it was remarkable to me. And at the, I think I traced that to the first time in my life when I started to embrace my childhood identity. Um, 
sort of the foundation that was rooted in our way of life as farmers, our occupation, or rather my father's occupation. And I went home and I showed slides of that wheat harvest to all my friends in San Francisco, and I was really excited to see how they thought it was beautiful too. So I started to be okay to be from a farm background. It didn't seem ho-dunk anymore. It actually seemed like a privilege to be from such a background. Unfortunately, I don't have access, immediate access to those slides anymore, but on my computer I had one print, and it's a little bit blurred, but I can't resist showing it to you anyway. This is from that wheat harvest. That's my father on the side of the wheat truck. And I have to just show it to you because of how happy he is and what a man he is uh, of his element, a man in his element. My brother called it striding over the earth. That's what farmers liked to do, and that's what my dad was great at, and he really enjoyed his occupation. I didn't begin to re embrace the other part of my roots, which, I, which was the land on which all that was happening until I started going camping in the High Sierra Nevada mountains and the deserts of California. And I began to realize that I loved being outdoors. And I had always loved it, but I just didn't know it. I didn't think about it. I didn't ever have to think about it growing up. I tend to think of that, uh, these as two strains of our identity, the occupation, what my family did for a living, and then the land itself. So what we did on the land and the land itself. And sometimes those two things are actually in conflict with each other. There came this particular moment that I trace as the moment when I had my rebirth as an outdoors person. And I'm just going to read, oh, it's a couple of pages from my book. When that happened, it was on a trip to the High Sierra Mountains with my boyfriend, a camping trip, my first backpacking trip ever. And at first, I followed him up the mountain very resentfully because I had never had to climb anything higher than a windmill before. And here I was walking up a mountain with a, back, a backpack on, and I found it just terribly insulting that I would have to do that. But when I got up to the very top and looked down and saw what I was about to see, everything changed. And I'm, I'm going to start reading right when that happened. We stand on the edge of what he tells me is a cirque, a silver gray cup of granite filled with glacier melt, as clear as the air. A few trees grow on the shoreline, protected by this wall of granite, and in their shade on the water, we can see the undersides of boulders and the sandy bottom. My boyfriend beams a dare at me, then slaloms down the gravelly path, tossing his pack, his hat, his shirt. He is putting on a show, but I can't take my eyes off the water. It beckons, glass-like, receptive, the world's purest element in its purest form, seemingly innocent, yet I suspect it is so cold that a prolonged immersion in it could kill. Every cell in my body and every neuron in my heat-addled brain thirst for that immersion. I make my way down the path faster than feels safe, skidding over talus, banging my hip on a boulder, and almost falling more than once. I drop my pack on the pine duff along the shoreline, then my boots, socks, and jeans. An unusually dark boulder with mica sparkles in it, with mica sparkles in it, calls to me, but it's almost too hot to touch. So I dip my hat into the startling cold water, scooping it onto the rock, then lower myself into the now wet and warm shallow depression down the boulder's center. I hang my arm off the edge and trailing my fingers through the water, begin a slow, delectable flirtation. The high altitude sun presses my back as with a dry iron, while below me, riffles slap rock. Glare refracts off the water, dappling my arm and flashing hypnotically on my retinas. I am irradiated, intoxicated. I rise to my feet, pull my now wet shirt and underwear off, and try not to notice where my boyfriend is or whether he notices me. I don't care about his shouts of cold and pleasure or the splashes he makes cavorting. This is about me and you, I think, toward the lake, not me and him. Go, I urge, go, go. I've done something really stupid. 
The lake is liquid ice, the cold so shocking I panic at first. Echoes of my scream circle the jagged peaks. So do those of my boyfriends, yee-haw! His example and approval help me resist the urge to splash ashore. It only takes a half minute or so, and I'm willingly giving myself to the water, and it is giving itself to me, driving me into my body. I am nothing but sensation, all of it glorious. I dive back under. I've never swum naked in broad daylight, and I love the water's silken feel on my skin. I love watching my hands move underwater, as if I were a creature who evolved in this medium. Drifting like a fetus in a womb of laced sunlight, I ponder the startling clarity and whiteness of my hands and feet. But I'm beginning to feel this strange, hot sensation high in my stomach, as if a burner has ignited inside of me. This cannot be good. Because my brain has lost all sense and thrown me into this predicament, my body is resorting to metabolic triage, my blood abandoning my limbs and rushing to save my vital organs. I climb out and shivering lie down on my boulder. Soon the sun's high heat penetrates me, lifting and nullifying the lake's deep cold. Enlivened, awakened, I savor all to which I've been reborn. The rasping call and obsidian sheen of a raven slicing the depthless blue above me. The tickle of my arms, sun-bleached hairs as I drag my lips over them, breathing my skin's smell. The fragrance doesn't come only from the lake, but from granite, ozone, and pine. I did a lot of things during the six years I lived in the city after my first divorce, but nothing I did affected me so powerfully as that first dive into a mountain lake. I couldn't get enough of the scent of water and wilderness on my skin. I think coming from a dry place, I had a natural affinity for water, and now it, it became an entire immersion. And I'm, ever since then, I have not been able to go near a clear body of water in the summertime without getting in. I have to get in to almost any water, and it doesn't really matter how cold it is. Eventually, I know. It's like I get this sinking feeling in my stomach. When I see a very cold body of water, even in the springtime, because I know that I'm going to be getting in it before I leave. And I just can't help myself. But I have a similar feeling about desert, interestingly enough. And I think that after this, my boyfriend and I went to uh, the Death Valley for a uh, vacation. And I write about that in my book as well. And I think what it mainly was was the way that aridity frees light. I was enthralled by how everything is saturated with light when you're in a semi-arid or an arid environment. And that was part of my childhood as well. So this was really sort of a waking up to the, my landed identity as a child, to the natural world that I'd had as a child. So I became so enamored of the desert that I actually went and found this ranching couple who owned this little rock house out in the middle of pretty much absolutely nowhere, triangulated by Barstow, Needles, and um, Las Vegas, right out in the middle of that triangle. And um, I got them to let me fix it up and move into it. This is the rock house that I lived in for a couple of years. And every afternoon, I would get the two things I love most together. Let's see if I can get it to go there. I would go down to this stockwater storage tank, which is about six foot tall, and it was right next to this windmill, and I would dive into this bracing cold water that was being pumped to the surface uh, from deep underground. And right next to the uh, storage tank was this cottonwood tree, and in the cottonwood tree, there were tanagers nesting. And sometimes there were red-tailed hawks. So it was a really beautiful spot. I wrote about that uh, just very briefly, a couple of sentences. Daily I evol revolved. My arms and legs extended like clock dials at the center of everything, water and desert. The water being the desert's most profound expression of itself, the antithesis without which desert could not exist, the joy that made its barren beauty habitable. 
So these were the two archetypal poles that actually defined my childhood landscape as well, water and desert. In the Kansas that I grew up in, the western part of the state, I had the expansive vistas, and I was able to live there because of the cold, clear, luxurious Ogallala water that was pumped to the surface from deep underground. It made our great American desert habitable, essentially. Up until then, we were the great American desert, and then they went, oh, wait a minute, there's water here, <laughs> you know, and everything changed. <clears throat> well, this sojourn in the desert caused me to look at Kansas much differently when I wound up back there after my second marital mistake, which happened uh, when I met this cowboy in the Mojave who was totally ill-suited as either husband or father material, as it turned out. And I wound up uh, living back on my father's farm. Now, I call it his farm because the farm I grew up on had now been traded off, and he had some other land. And I moved into this house on that land and fixed it up and lived there. This is a picture of me and my father. We used to give each other a lot of grief over the fence each day or wherever we were. We liked to joke with each other a lot. And this is what we're caught doing that right now in this picture. And actually, even though it was quite humiliating to be back home under these circumstances, as you can imagine, I mean, I went away thinking I would succeed out in the big world, and here I came home having made another bad choice in husbands and um, needing family help. But my father and my mother were very gracious in offering me that help and very supportive, and it wound up that I had learned things out in the world that could be applied back home. Primarily, I had developed some interest in mechanical work, and I, I convinced my father that I was able to work on the farm with him. And he gradually began to think of me as the potential one of his three children who would carry on the farm after he died. So it all was very seductive, the whole notion that I could do that. I, I was crossing the gender divide of my childhood, it would not have been possible if I'd stayed home to ever find myself in this situation. So really, I guess it was good that I went away and learned all that stuff, and now I was back. But there were, he, it was also, here, here we are uh, in a field of commercial sunflowers, and I'm wearing those overalls because my belly's getting bigger. And here he is with my baby boy, Jake, so it was wonderful to be raising my son at home in the midst of family. But there were some problems, and they mostly had to do with the environmental issues for me. I didn't like the number of chemicals we were using on our crops. That was frightening to me. I felt like raising a son there that was particularly dangerous to him. Uh, and those chemicals came right up to my yard fence and beyond if I didn't stand my ground, which I had to stand my ground frequently. Um, also, many of the grasslands that I had grown up just taking for granted were no longer there. The pastures, the large pastures and so on, anything that was arable had pretty much been farmed at this point, and it was disappointing to me to see the grasslands disappear. But most important was um, the water. The water is what troubled me most of all. And so I'm going to read again from the book about that issue. When I wasn't training a John Deere's chrome arrow on some fence post or distant patch of weeds, I was one of my father's flood men. He would eventually convert to center pivot sprinklers, but when I lived there, we were still irrigating mostly out of huge pipes laid along the tops of the fields. Each summer morning and evening, I would belt Jake into his car seat in the blue Chevy pickup Dad had bought me for both farm and personal use and drive out to the corn. As I knocked the floodgates open, the water would gush out in beautiful arcs and with such force that if I tried to slice my hand through it, my arm would be thrown back. To direct the water into the furrows, I placed socks, tubes of woven plastic mounted on wire hoops over gates in the pipe. Having lived in the Mojave, I quickly adjusted to working in hot sun, and the work led to sensuous exhaustion at each day's end. 
In Main Street, I wrote in my journal, Sinclair Lewis calls the look of the land at sunset fulfilled. True of the land's creatures, too. Work in my past here made me one of these. But life in the desert had also sensitized me to the value of water. Imbued with the respect water demands where it is not readily accessible, I greeted the appearance of so much of it coming out of the ground in our desert-like heat as surreal. Why didn't all High Plains farmers, who had surely grown up conserving water just as my mother had, her father making her drink all she poured into the tin cup that hung on their windmill, not mistrust such bounty? I had not yet seen any of the maps that would later trouble me, no brown blots where the aquifer had been exhausted. All I had to go on was a gut feeling. I knew we couldn't draw that much water from the ground and expect to see it flowing forever. What would we do when we ran out? What would the next several thousand generations or years of High Plains inhabitants do for water? As I lay in my bed at night, the backs of my lids strobing with images of all the rows of corn I'd driven past that day and of silver water snaking down each furrow, the incessant growl of the pumps plagued my conscience. The big truck engines, converted to run on natural gas and mounted on concrete pads at the edges of the fields, seldom stopped, even at night. The water didn't belong to the farmers, although most of them seemed to think it did. The state allowed us to use it, but only up to the limits of the rights granted to us. Many farmers, however, didn't even bother to fill out forms reporting how much water they used. Dad was apparently among them. One day over dinner, he fished a letter out of his lunchbox and handed it to me. It was from the Kansas Water Office, informing him that from now on, farmers would be fined for not reporting. We didn't know how much water we'd pumped that year. The Water Office hadn't made us install meters yet, so the only way to figure it out was by using the bills that the utility company sent for each engine. Dividing the total gas usage by an estimate of how much the engines used in one hour, we could estimate the number of hours we'd pumped, then multiply by the engine's pumping rates. Dad said he tried to do all this himself, but he couldn't get his old noggin to do the numbers. I can still see the utility bills scattered over my kitchen table. I remember how confusing it was to discover that two of the wells shared a gas meter. But mostly I remember my shock when I totaled the numbers. We'd pumped 139 million gallons that season. Even though we irrigated more than 700 acres at the time, half of that amount went on to our 80-acre cornfield. That was more than 4,000 gallons of water for every bushel of corn we'd harvested. Hoping to prove that irrigated corn wasn't really profitable, I suggested I do a spreadsheet computing the cost of labor, fuel, depreciation, chemicals, seed, property taxes, everything. Go ahead, Dad said, compute your heart out. The conclusion I reached, we barely broke even on corn, until I factored in the subsidy checks, which put us $10,000 in the black. Are you satisfied, Dad asked. No, they're paying us to throw away water, and it's so irrational. The only reason people out here grow corn is because of the subsidies, but there's a corn surplus. The more we grow, the lower the price, so the more subsidies they have to give us. It's a vicious circle. That might be true, he allowed, but if the government paid Midwestern corn farmers to the east of us to grow corn, it wouldn't be fair to draw a line down the middle of the country and separate our poor, dry, old plains asses from those lucky so-and-sos who get rain. I sighed. Don't despair, Dad said. Big Daddy will put the plug in before it's too late. By Big Daddy, he met the government. He had faith in this. It was the government's job to look after the general good, preventing any serious harm individuals might cause in the pursuit of private gain. In his lifetime, he'd seen the feds bust trusts, protect unions, and protect the environment with clean air and water laws. The farm program dictated many of his practices. In return for his subsidy checks, he had to leave a certain amount of organic matter on the surface. He'd been required to terrace his hillier land, the Soil Conservation Service, set up in FDR's presidency, enforced these measures to prevent our topsoil from abandoning itself to water erosion. 
or the wind from picking it up and dropping it on Oklahoma as it had done during the Dust Bowl. Big Daddy always had his hand in, and he would certainly reach in and do something before the water was all gone. In the meantime, my daddy would raise his brows, cock his head at me, and smile with overstated cheer. Until then, I got mine. He always said that to me, and it always got my goat, but in fact, he didn't want to see the water gone any more than anybody else. He just thought that he was a businessman like any other businessman. His job was to make money for his family, and that's what he was going to do until someone told him he needed to, to do things differently. He had gone to college ag school. He knew that the water would not last forever. The title of this talk, The Water That Could Last Forever, was a myth. It could last forever if we didn't irrigate out of it, but because we irrigate at the rates we do, and we were only one of 32,000, we are, presently there are 32,000 irrigated farms on, that are pumping Ogallala water. So you can imagine um, that over time, that's just not sustainable. So it was really a myth, all the way back to 1906, when Willard D. Johnson, a government geologist, came out to survey the High Plains for the Department of Agriculture. Um, we've known that it wouldn't last if we irrigated out of it. He said that irrigation would soon exhaust the stored supply if we could figure out how to irrigate out of it. Every scientist who came after him predicted the same thing. So the degree or the measure uh, to which people, well, the degree to which people believed that the water could last forever was really just a measure of their denial. And, but you wouldn't find very many deniers out there anymore. Most people really do know that the water is soon going to be exhausted. The, what, I went on to do water reports for my family for the next 20 years. The 139 million gallons that we pumped that year was not that much, really. We, there were many years when we pumped more than 300 million gallons out of those five wells. Farmers do want to conserve. They are making a lot of strides towards conserving. They are using better technologies. There's water probes being used now, telemetry on the sprinkler irrigation systems, which are themselves much more efficient than the flood irrigation that we were using. Farmers can now control their wells with their cell phones. When the, when the moisture probes tell them that it's time to turn the sprinkler off, they can do it no matter where they are. There aren't a lot of adapters of that technology yet, but it's really growing. There's more and more farmers using that technology. They're also beginning to impose some limitations on themselves. In GMD4, the Groundwater Management District, where I'm from, they just passed another uh, LEMA, where they're limiting, it's, I always forget what LEMA stands for. I was gonna look that up before the talk, I forgot again. but. It means that they're limiting the amount of irrigation water they use in a particular area. Now, that, now there's a district-wide lima where everyone who is falling at a particularly fast rate is being cut back in the amount of water they can use, and that's a self-imposed restriction. So you have to hand them some credit. And also, Kansas is being very, very forward-thinking in this, comparatively speaking. Um, but when you talk to farmers, most of them will say, well, they've got kids that they want to have be allowed to farm. They want their grandchildren to be able to farm. So they want it to last for at least, you know, what can they pray, what can they hope for? Maybe two or three more generations. But to me, that's, that's actually very short-sighted, especially when you think that that water has been around for the last 10 to 20,000 years. It supported Paleolithic man going all the way back to the Clovis culture in New Mexico. That's an Ogallala area uh, where there's no more surface water, and so you couldn't support Paleolithic man back there now. Uh, same with the Hell's Gap people in northeast Colorado. I have a cousin who ranches there where they had a Smithsonian dig of a bison kill site that goes back 10,000 years. That was on the Arikari, which was named after the Arakara Indians. That water no longer runs. 
So really, I think it's kind of short-sighted to just talk in terms of a couple generations. But when I suggest that, I'm considered a little bit radical. When I suggest that to farmers, um, we're used to seeing, well, actually, I think I was, OK. I'm a little turned around in my slides. But here's a picture of what's happened in, in terms of depletion. When you look at Nebraska, you'll see there's still lots of water. It's blue up there. That's because it's the sand hills. Parts of Nebraska are in trouble. Uh, in the southwestern part of Nebraska, there is not very much, where's Nebraska? There's not very much water anymore. And going into Kansas, these dark red areas, that's 75% decline in those areas. So you see there's lots of areas of very serious decline the orange and yellow areas. For a closer look at what's happening in Kansas, you can see how serious it is here. All those dark red uh, areas are areas that we have only 25 years left of water. Um, the yellow ones are 100 to 250. The orange ones are 25 to 50 years of water. There are 350 miles of the watershed in north, in that tri-state area where Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas all come together. Those streams have all dried up in that, in that area. So all of this affects what happens on the surface. We're used to seeing images of the aquifer that look like this. But I actually prefer this artist's rendition of the aquifer. Obviously, you could not see the aquifer out of an airplane. But I like this because it shows the connectivity between the reserves that are underground, those blue, watery-looking areas. Whoops. <laughs> those blue, watery areas and how they connect to streams. That's feeding the Platte River there. And when you think of the rivers that cross the plains, almost all of them rise directly out of the Ogallala Aquifer. They don't rise in the mountains. The Platte does but it's also fed by the Ogallala. Uh, one fork of the Canadian does, the Arkansas does. But the rest of the rivers out there all come up from the Ogallala Aquifer. But when, when we talk about the aquifer and the state debate that's been going on around what to be done about the water, very seldom does anyone talk about the land, or very seldom does anyone talk about the effect on the streams in those areas. To me, the health and beauty of the landscape is the real bottom line. We're always talking about the economy, and that's very important, obviously. People can't live without earning a living. But uh, they can't live without water, either. I define beauty, actually, as a survival instinct in my book. I mentioned that when we perceive beauty on a landscape, what we are actually seeing is the ability of that landscape to, su to support life for generations to come. So the real bottom line is whether or not, is what the landscape itself looks like. And there we're seeing a lot of losses. We're in the red. We're not seeing gains at all. So in me, there's, there's been this disconnect between these two sources of my identity between the occupation that my parents practiced and between the land. So it's sort of the house within the house. Our farming was a house within a house. And the big house, which is the land itself, is suffering. There's this Milan Kundera uh, quote that I ran across the other day where it, he said, struggle of men goes against Power. The struggle of men against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. I remember what Kansas was like in my childhood. It's not pure nostalgia. I remember a healthy place. And that's part of the role of the writer and the memoirist, I think, is to record memory. If you don't do it, someone else is just going to erase those memories. It's as if they never existed. I remember what the place looked like, and I cannot stop remembering it. It's a major source of my identity. It's the whole reason that I write. So when I, uh, oh, by the way, there's the watershed, uh, an illustration of how the creeks and rivers have 
dried up over the years from 1961 to 1994. This is a farmhouse that I grew up in. You, you would think, this, this picture was taken before I was born actually, but you would think that this house was built to stay, that we were there to stay. There's the grasslands that I grew up around. I can't stop remembering what those grasslands looked like. And every time I drive through that part of the country, every time I see a little patch of grass, I have to pull off. I'm like my dad, he used to, he'd see a farmed field and he'd start driving toward the ditch because he was checking out some other farmer's work. But I'm like that with grass. I see that grass and I have to stop and look and gaze and take pictures. Kansas was a wheat state. Wheat was appropriate for our environment. Kansas still is a wheat state. It's appropriate for our environment because it was um, brought over from the steppes of Russia, uh, which is a very similar climate. It's a very drought tolerant crop and it survives winters. It's winter wheat. That's my father in a wheat field testing a bud for ripeness. Now this next slide was supposed to be a picture of a windmill with a windmill creaking so you get a sense of what the used to sound like to bring water to the surface and it sounded like this <laughs> okay that's what it sounded like a very gentle kind of quiet uh, serene sound this is what the streams looked like in western Kansas, and there still are places where you can go and, and see places like this. This was in Thomas County just last spring. This is called Cumberland. And this is what I look like when I find those places. I just get blissed out and want, want wade in them, and I just can't get over what a miracle water is in a dry landscape. What a gift it is to the surface. I ran across this beautiful definition of spring when I was writing the book. A place where water flows from rock or soil without the aid of man. It's a beautiful definition. And that's the gift it is to us. Now, this is the irrigation sprinkler that replaced that house I grew up in. And the landscape is, and where I come from is largely empty of people now. Most of the farmers have moved to town and many farmers have moved away entirely. Here's an aerial photo of what the landscape looks like now. The gray green places are those pastures. That's all that remains of the pasture lands. And they're usually still there only because they're not really arable. They're probably too steep to farm. This is what we replaced it with, which is a beautiful crop. Actually, you can't argue with that. And every farmer loves to see corn. But this is what the landscape sounds like now. And this is Smoky Hill Gardens, a place where my family and I used to go picnic together when I was a child. It was a little lake. It was a fishing lake. And it's a totally bone dry now. If you go due west of this, you get to a place called the Sherman State Fishing Lake, which is bone dry. Most of the Smoky Hill River in that part of the state is dry. This is because of the direct hydro connectivity between the underground water sources and the streams and because of high impact irrigation. So I think Kansas is a microcosm for the nation. It's, we always, in this nation, we went west to mine the resources. We went west to plunder and come back rich. It started with beaver pelts, and it continued through gold and oil. Here, what we do is we ship the water back east in the form of cows and, and wheat, or cows and corn, cattle and corn. When I went to my mother's funeral, uh, one of our old neighbors said to me, he was remarking on how the landscape had empty out, emptied out, how so very few people lived there anymore. He said, it's just been a slow migration. 
He couldn't believe it. It's just it's like that's all it ever was. It was just a migration. So despite the big houses we built and all of that, we were really doing what Wallace Stegner says we do in the West, which was we, we use it up and move on. So there are three things that I think that I have to offer in the discussion of the aquifer. The first, the, the first and most important, I think, is the fact that I, coming from a farm family like I do, I was duly rooted in the natural world and in the occupation, what we did for a living. And I only became aware of how deeply rooted I was in the natural world after I left. And so I got that perspective that you get from being far away and rediscovering the natural world in a different place. And I, so I think I can bring that to the discussion. I think that most people who grew up in that landscape are deeply identified with it and attached to it, but I don't think they are deeply, con I don't think they're necessarily consciously attached to it. I, we don't talk about the beauty of the plains that much, but the plains are very beautiful. It's not like mountains, you know. If you went to Colorado and you cut down every tree in the Rocky Mountains, people would be really upset. But if you go to the western plains and you farm up every stitch of grass, people aren't upset about that. But the quality of the experience of being in a place that is plowed versus a place where there's grass is, uh, it's like 180 degrees, it's so different. Also, as part of that awareness of the natural connection, there's an awareness of language. I went to a conference recently where every time someone talked about the farmers who were in the audience, they referred to them as producers. They weren't farmers, they were producers. So that, is, that emphasizes their relationship in the economic system, not their relationship to the land itself. It's like talking about a writer as a content provider which they do, or it's like talking about a person who eats as a consumer, right? It's reducing us to just um, factors in, a, in an economic equation. Secondly, I, I can question corn openly and do it because I don't have to live there maybe, partly. Um, the, the farm program policy continues to underwrite the depletion of the aquifer by subsidizing irrigated corn with crop insurance um, premiums, which are incentivized so that farmers are encouraged to grow corn, and the ethanol policy, which encourages us to grow corn in order to feed, feed it to our cars, even though we know that a gallon of, it takes about a gallon of fossil fuel to make a gallon of ethanol. So that it really makes no sense at all. Corn is the real elephant in the room in this discussion. It's totally amazing how m many dedicated policy people and farmers all can get together at that conference I went to recently, and only once did someone breathe the words, oh, we could maybe make some changes to the farm program. You know, it's not something that is generally discussed. I imagine this corn stalk growing up through the ceiling that nobody sees, you know. Um, and thirdly, I am complicit in the problem. I, am, uh, I inherited part of that farm. And coming from a background where I had to wrestle with my conscience and try to figure out what I could do about it, I think I can kind of embody other people's conscience, those people who are also wrestling with that problem can see how one person did it. And I, I can't say I succeeded. The subtitle of my book has the word love in it. Um, the lengths I went to in order to try to get back into right relationship with my family land were pretty extreme. I managed to fall in love with a guy out there <laughs> because I thought that would make it possible for me to move back and maybe farm my land more sustainably and, and figure out how to do it in a way that uh, I could live with. As it turned out, well, that guy and I went um, out and explored the land a lot, too. I wanted to share that with you, and I became more aware of the Cheyenne Indian history there, and I became much more deeply equated with my landscape, the landscape of my birth, than I had been uh, grow actually growing up in it, so that was a, a good thing. But 
eventually this guy decided we weren't going to work out and broke up with me. And as a result, I was kind of left trying to figure out, well, is there a way I can go back there and live? Is there a way I can farm it? My brother wanted to get out. He was, it, it was causing him a lot of stress. He started talking about selling. My father had always told us, hang on to your land. And we had always thought, we will. We are the only people we know in our family who might do it, but we'd be the last people to sell. But eventually, uh, partly because I thought I could escape my role in the problem, I agreed to sell. And I'm going to pick up where that, de where that decision got me. I'm getting close to the end here. All you need to know in this following passage um, is that I refer to the three brothers who bought our land as the linebackers. They're big hulking guys. And my father's name was Harold. I sat in the hallway of an old dormitory on a campus that was once a seminary in Canyon City, Colorado. It was 2008, two years after we'd sold the farm. The organizers of the Buddhist retreat had placed wooden chairs outside three doors. Behind the doors, the teachers were granting private interviews. I was next in line for Terry. I'd chosen her because she was the only female teacher and because when students asked questions after Dharma talks, Waves of emphatic emotion, empathetic emotion crossed her face like the shadows of clouds sailing over prairie. I expected Terry to be in the lotus position she had amazingly held throughout the previous day and a half of the retreat, but now she sat like a normal 60-year-old in a stuffed vinyl chair. She had long gray blonde hair and a welcoming presence. How was the retreat going for me? Did I have any problems meditating for long periods, she asked. No, other than I tended to get sleepy. That's not uncommon, Terry said. Go take a nap if you need to. Sometimes people come here for, from working nonstop. That's me, I said. I've been writing a book for what seems like forever. What is your book about? At first it was about the Ogallala Aquifer, the water under the Great Plains. But it turned out it was about more than that. My family and this man I fell in love with who lived back there, except he broke up with me and then we sold our family farm and I discovered that's what I'd been writing about all along. Selling the farm? Yes, it was up to my brother and me to save it. I mean, this has nothing to do with the Dharma or anything, but that's what I've been thinking about when I'm supposed to be meditating. Is your father still living? She does have a way, I thought. He died 10, no, 11 years ago. I haven't quite come to terms with selling his farm. It's all he ever did. The retreat is helping, though, so thank you. I was prepared to leave, but Terry's eyes kept me pinned. I know it's just attachment and ego, I said. I added in an effort to be a good meditation student. It's OK to feel the pain, Terry said. You're grieving a loss. A warm sheet of tears filled my eyes. It's hard to, I mean, Terry probed on. Do you feel as if you sold your father when you sold the farm? A tsunami rose in my chest. Forgive yourself, Terry said. The tsunami broke. I hadn't let myself cry this openly in front of anyone since Clark died. My face contorted, mouth open, lips downstretched. Would he want you to feel bad, Terry asked. I could hardly breathe, let alone answer. I grabbed a tissue from the strategically located box. He just wanted to share all he had with you, Terry said. He wanted you to have his connection to the land. Dabbing my eyes with the tissue, I said, I'm not so sure about that. No? Do you want to meditate on it for a minute? I sat up straight, assumed the posture, shoulders straight, feet planted, parallel, hands on thighs, connected to the land. I tried that phrase out on the dad in memory, the dad who presided perennially in my psyche. His face turned red and he smirked with embarrassment and disdain, his hyper-tuned schmaltz detector going off. No, we kids weren't supposed to hang on to our land because we were connected to it. 
We were supposed to hang on to it because it was real estate. It was real. The price might go up, it might go down, but it would always be there. Cash would slip through our fingers. Stocks would crash. We would end up like Uncle Leonard in his decrepit trailer house with its weather-warped plywood porch on the edge of Goodland, or Aunt Ruth in her purple and yellow basement house, or Uncle Johnny who had to come home and work for Dad because he lost all his money investing in city real estate, or Uncle Raymond who was ending his days in a VA home in South Dakota, broke, struggling for the rest of our lives to make ends meet. Dad's parents and Mom's parents had managed to hold on through the 30s drought, some said that the 50s drought had been even worse. And then along came Bruce, my brother, and I, who sold in a wet year. Then the other shoe dropped, as Dad liked to say. The government mandate on ethanol had caused the price of corn to triple. Land values tracked grain prices like bird dogs track cents. If we'd waited until now to sell, we could have gotten more than two times what we'd sold for. I imagined the three linebackers smirking. They had foreseen this. At closing, they had sat across from Mom and me in the bank's green carpeted room, three hulks who'd probably grown up on tractors and who'd given their dad what he wanted most, sons who farmed and farmed and farmed. I asked them flat out, are you going to plow that grass in the west pasture? The oldest one, the herald in their clan, answered, we paid dry land cropland prices for it, so yes, we're going to farm it. Hell yes, we are, he probably thought. Who does she think she is even asking? They didn't graze cattle themselves, apparently. They bought cattle off other people's grass and finished them in their feedlot. They'd even planted all of the wheat ground to corn. Bruce said, or Bruce said, plus, all of the irrigation circles. They must be using our water rights to the hilt. They must, Terry touched my knee. I'm sorry, I said. Did you have any insights? It was the connection to the land thing. Dad would never have used a phrase like that. I watched her absorb this. She said, he did have a connection though. I nodded. Yes, but he didn't know it. So do you. You just have it in a different way. I guess, I said. I'm not so sure anymore. After the sale, I became a lost soul without a construct. Actually, there had once been two constructs, and they'd always been in opposition. The conscious one of ourselves as landowners and our unconscious connection to the land. On the Carlson farm, we'd all been part of a tapestry, a weave. There were animals and grains, vegetables and prairie, trees and people, play and work, mud and stars, the sense of manure and of flowers. I choose these things at random, and it doesn't matter what order I list them in. A specific list of the 10,000 things, to use a phrase from the Tao Te Ching, would fill many pages. They were all entangled of a piece. But when we traded that farm and moved to town, then when I left Kansas altogether, I became a lone thread. While I was trying to weave myself back into the natural world in the mountains and deserts of California, my family's relationship with our land back home was continuing to unravel. Dad drove to it every day. He didn't live on it. Its meaning had shifted from the seat of our family's life to solely a source of revenue. Dad's success growing crops still affirmed and satisfied him, but his land had become more of a thing to him and to us. It had become a financial asset, not who we were. So I asked myself after the sale, who are we now? And that, it was a terrible identity crisis, I have to tell you. And I think that not knowing is not knowing who we are, not knowing that that land actually made us who we are, not knowing that we actually love the place for what it is and not what we did there, is the key obstacle that prevents us from preserving what's left of the natural world there. So I write today in order to retain my identity I've actually been writing to retain my identity all along. When I went back to school in Iowa and started writing, 
I thought I was going to write about the Mojave Desert. I thought I was going to write about San Francisco. But I was writing about Western Kansas. And I think I was doing that because my relationship to that place was always at risk. And I didn't realize how at risk it really was. But I have no physical roots there anymore, just mental ones and spiritual ones. And I have to tell you that they are strong, and they are getting stronger all the time. And when I come and do talks like this and think about, OK, what do I think now? What's changed? What is what is my message now? It's always everything I'm doing and thinking about and writing about is still about Western Kansas. When I do the commentary series for HPPR, it's about Western Kansas. It's like I live still in that place in my head. I still really live there. It's a very simple. I'd like to say that I went I thought it would be a kind of a nice play on words to say that I went from um, an identity complex, like I talked about earlier, to a complex identity. But that's not what happened. I went from a really s simple identity. I went from an identity complex to a simple embrace of the identity I was born to be part of. So if uh, you think I'm preaching, you can tell me to go jump in a lake, and I'll do it. Um, because the true love affair is with water, and that was the true inspiration of this book. Thank you. There we go. Uh, does anyone have a question? Don't make me ask a question. I always have a question. Just not as fast as it's being consumed. The, it's recharging at about the rate of an inch a year. They used to think it recharged at under half an inch a year in western Kansas, but under irrigated land, it's recharging at the rate of about an inch a year. There's some disagreement now. I wouldn't call it disagreement. There's a new study out that's saying that maybe it's recharging faster than we thought it was. Um, the study that came out at the end of 2013 from Kansas State University said that in 50 years, 70% of the aquifer would be drained in Kansas. Mm. If you're left with only 30% in any given area, that's really usually not enough to irrigate with. You start pulling sand up, and the cost of pumping gets extreme and you can't pump at the rate you, you formerly pumped at. But now there's a new study out, um, which is a more restricted area, where they're, start, they're thinking that, well, maybe, um, maybe we'd only have to cut back about 27%. The Kansas State study said that you'd have to cut back 65 to 85% in order to level out so that you had no more declines. This study is saying, well, maybe they only have to cut back that much, which is actually a reachable goal, because with this new technology, they are capable of doing that. It, there would have to be um, mass adoption of the new technology and incentives, getting people to use it. But you know, the truth probably lies somewhere between those two extremes. Uh, it probably is going to take a, a cutback of maybe 50% or something in order to level out the declines. There was a piece that I'm sure you saw that got a lot of play uh, in the last two weeks. It was published on the New Food Economy website about uh, rural depopulation in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I think I read that. Was it in the Food and Economy right. originally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Yeah, and then it got re uh, sent around today in the Twitterverse under uh, another label calling, you know, what's the matter with Kansas part three? Okay. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Um, so your book, you know, a lot of it is about people and land. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of that article is about how people are producers now. They aren't mm -hmm. farmers, right. using, using your language. Right. And there are some folks who teach at our big land grant institutions like K-State who argue you need to get even bigger as a producer or you aren't going to make it. Mm-hmm. So as you're talking about this grand dream of one of these days altering the farm bill, mm -hmm. 
Um, how would you alter the farm bill to turn producers back into farmers? I think that you could put in incentives for returning to dry land crops and also incentives for drought tolerant crops, and incentives for crops that require less irrigation. Um, I don't really understand why it matters. I, I do sort of understand why it matters to farmers, but when you look at how much money they get from the federal government, if that money were the same, but it were coming for purposes that were aimed towards conservation instead of toward growing a crop that's as thirsty as corn, then why does it really matter? And the reason it really matters to farmers is that they just love to grow corn. I mean, it's, it's like a, a gardener who likes to see flowers, you know, I mean, they just love the bounty of the crop and the amount of grain and the grain's really a protein rich and, but we have this whole um, beef, you know, feedlot, processed beef uh, system that's dependent on corn and that is questionable as well. That's another thing that the federal farm program in an ideal universe could um, subsidize a return to grazing and to grass-fed beef, which I eat entirely grass-fed beef, and it's great. There's nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful, and it's better for us. Um, beef that's cat fattened on corn has the wrong kind of omega fats in it and contributes to diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense that we're relying on uh, feedlot beef. So that's another thing that could change. So the, the forward narrative, I think, for most Americans is that we fill up the empty places, right? Um, we're a suburban people mostly now, and our stories of the last 40 or 50 years are about how we build and we build and we build. And I think the High Plains are one of the few places left in America where it goes in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And if you've come from that area in the last few decades, you're, you're seeing this depopulation. Um, you know, you showed pictures of the rivers that have sort of dried up. I mean, I grew up four miles from the Smoky Hill River and pulled a channel cat and crappie out of there all the time as a kid. Now it would take a backhoe to go down about 10 feet probably before you'd find water. Mm -hmm. So as a writer, I guess what I'm asking is, um, how do you, do you see a kind of sadness, or how do you deal with that in your work when you're connected to a place that's going through this kind of entropy? Mm -hmm. Because the story is one of decline, and it, it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to reconcile that yeah. with the bigger culture that we live in. Yes. Well, uh, yes, I feel a lot of sadness, and I think the sadness that I feel drives my work. I want to speak out for what I love. It's sort of like seeing your mother die in the nursing home and not go to her bedside. You know, I'm going to be a witness, but also in the act of writing, I'm envisioning a universe, or not a universe, a world that, uh, that is the world I want to live in, and that's what we have to do in order to make change. I'm just one person, but I'm one person that has that vision. I'm sharing it with others, hopefully spreading that vision a little bit. And when I can imagine, it's a lot easier to imagine a positive future when you're doing what little bit you can to make that future happen. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to live with yourself. I think, I think we all need to contribute in some way to, what, to correcting the problems that we really care about most. And this happens to be the one I care about most. I was back for the high school reunion in Goodland uh, actually, I got to ride on the homecoming float. Uh, I got to ride on the hay wagon. <laughs> you know, so every 50 years, you, the, the 50 year graduates get to go back and do that. And what I was amazed by, even though, yes, the town is suffering, yes, there's a whole bunch of empty stores on Main Street, was the people who did stay and are just such contributors to that community. And, they were coming out, and they made that whole parade happen and organized the everything, and they're doing their duty every day, you know? And I can't live there anymore because of the way my life has evolved, but I can still do my part. They're still trying to make that community work, and I, so I can do my part to try to make Kansas make sense again in my, in my estimation.
You talked about that um, your father, was, he really groomed your, his sons, your brothers, to take over the farm mm -hmm. for him. And um, do you think, and I hear lots of, I'm familiar with lots of women who've grown up farming or ranching. The daughter had the interest in the operation where the sons didn't. Uh -huh. And the dad, their fathers, you know, wouldn't let them drive the tractor, wouldn't let them mm -hmm. do the cowboying. Do you think if your father had groomed you to take over the farm, you would have stayed? And do you think if more women had entered that profession, been allowed to enter the profession, would agriculture look different today? Well, yeah, I think agriculture would be different. I think there definitely would have been more women who did stay um, to take over. There have been less brain drain and less, um, less just good people drain, you know. Uh, me personally, I'm not so sure. Uh, maybe, but that was that that era I grew up in. That there was so much emphasis on the sciences, and there was so much emphasis on uh, our self-image of ourselves was not that great. I mean, it was it was like conflicted actually. On the one hand, we th we were very proud of my dad, and he was a very successful farmer, and we were really proud of that, you know. But on the other hand, he wanted. And he wanted his sons to farm, but on the other hand, we didn't think that farming counted as um, as as an it, it wouldn't speak well of us. And I think that might have been me too. I mean, not all my brothers felt that way, and I think I would have felt that way too. Maybe I would have thought, no, it's not. God. I don't get to make my mark on the world. I need to make my mark on the world. Exactly. I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I left, and then when I came back in the 80s and I looked around, here I was, a single mother with a baby boy, and I looked around and I thought, hmm, maybe the people who stayed had it right, you know, because they, they had extended family, and, you know, they, they were raising their kids in a healthy environment, kind of, if you didn't count the chemicals, but... <laughs> Yeah, I start, that was the first time it ever dawned on me that, hmm, maybe I made the wrong decision when I left. You know. Well, thank you, Julene. Thank you so much. And we have the books downstairs, and she can sign books down there for us on the way out. So thank you. All right, thank you.